Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, as we are doing today, and our recordings are then posted on our website for you to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of those archive recordings. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on our show. Um, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. We're like the state library here in Nebraska, and we provide services to all types of libraries in the state. Um, so you will find things on our show for um, academics, K-12, publics, corrections, museums, archives, anything that's a library. <laughs> um, that's really our only criteria. Um, if it's something uh, something cool that a library is doing, we bring in speakers to talk about uh, some service or product we think may be useful, um, things that are specific here in Nebraska for our, our libraries. Um, so our topics will run the gamut. You will find anything and everything possibly in, in our archives and in our upcoming shows. We do have uh, Nebraska Library Commission staff sometimes do presentations, as I mentioned, for things that are more specific to what we're offering here. Um, but we also bring in guest speakers, and we have a guest speaker with us this morning um, that we'll get to in just a second. But what I want to briefly do just quickly, I've been reminding people, our libraries of this every week, is go to our Nebraska Library Commission webpage here. We are still um, at the height and in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And here in Nebraska, we are help trying doing the best we can do to help gather resources and information for our libraries. So for our Nebraska libraries, this is actually you know, public, anybody can get to our page here, but um, we do have some things here that are specific to Nebraska um, links. But we have a link here that is um, pinned right to the top of our main homepage that goes right to all of our pandemic resources. We also have a list that we're keeping based on if we um, libraries have reported to us, if they're open, closed, um, special accommodations, doing curbside, Wi-Fi in the parking lot, whatever the situation is, trying to keep that as most up to date as we can for Nebraska libraries. Uh, but our pandemic page here is a, just a blog post that um, has um, basic links to updating things. We've got some maps of our libraries, um, but here's the main page. We have a lot of information depending on your situation. What do I do with my kids, financial help, unemployment, etc. But I just wanted to highlight specifically our library page where we have gathered any information we can find to help our libraries, libraries navigate the current pandemic. Um, information about opening, closing, policies, um, how to hold your meetings, um, some reading programs, et cetera, et cetera. So please do keep an eye on this. Um, we highly recommend the Realm project being done right now by OCLC and IMLS, where they are. This is specifically studying um, library materials. How long does the virus last on? things that are typically lent out um, via libraries and they're doing research on that so definitely keep an eye on that that is you know there's lots of news out there information about how the virus acts but this is something that is being done specifically related to libraries so I just want to make everyone aware of that information that we have there. If you are not in Nebraska check your state library or your state library association they may have the same information for you out there so that may be the same as ours we have links to a lot of national things like um oclc obviously ala cdc world health organization you know all of those things but there may be things specific to your state as well so on to today's show with us this morning and i'm going to actually hand over to you now elizabeth let's get your slides up um there we go there you, go. you should see the pop-up now to show your screen Yes, is this working? Let me hit present, and yes. then now hopefully you should be able to see my yes, slides. There it is, full screen, yes, perfect. All right, so um, today we are gonna talk about, well, I can say that creating accessible materials for library instruction. Um, Elizabeth White is with us. Good morning, Elizabeth. Good and morning. From Towson University in Maryland, on the East Coast. And um, she's going to talk about um, helping out doing library instruction. This is um, one of our many sessions, if you've been with me for the last few months on Encompass Live. Um, in March, there was supposed to have been a conference called the Library Technology Conference in um, St. Paul, Minnesota. That was canceled. That was right at the beginning of when all of the COVID-19 pandemic really blew up. 
and I was a scheduled person, and so was Elizabeth. <laughs> so I've um, brought, I've been able to get be lucky and bring some of those presenters, at least on our show, to get the information out there, and so that we can sh you can share your um, presentation. So I will just hand it over to you now, Elizabeth. Take it away and tell us about how we can help out our library patrons with this. Wonderful. Thank you for the introduction, Krista, and thank you all for being here today. As Krista mentioned, I was originally planning to present on this topic at the LibTech 2020 conference. And while I'm disappointed that that didn't happen, because I'm actually from Minnesota originally, and that would have been a nice trip home for me, I'm right. delighted to have the opportunity to present this to you today from my kitchen in Baltimore instead. <laughs> so you'll notice on the bottom of my slides, I have two URLs for you. The first is a tiny URL link to these presentation slides, which is tinyurl.com slash ebwhite dash accessibility. And yes, my name is in fact E.B. White, which is highly <laughs> appropriate for a librarian. Absolutely. And, and I'll mention the, you while you're mentioning that the presentation that when we do have the recording and the archive available, I will also have a direct link to those slides as well. So that'll also be in that same page there. So you can have that. Perfect. And then the second link that I have there is for an approximate transcript of this presentation, which is tinyurl.com slash ebwhite dash access dash transcript. Now I have to say that this is an approximate transcript only. While I am a woman of many talents, speaking from a script is not one of them. So while I will have all of the informational content there that I intend to give you verbally today, the wording is definitely going to differ. Um, from what I actually end up saying for you today. So with all of that in mind, let's get started since I have a packed agenda for you today. First, I'll start by explaining what it is I mean by accessibility and why it's important in libraries. Then I will move into some general considerations for creating accessible materials. So some ideas that you can use regardless of what type of content that you're creating. They'll apply across many different platforms. Then I'll look into some specifics for commonly used documents and file types that librarians use in their instruction. And then I will leave you with a few concrete tips for things that you can do to improve your practice right now. My goal today is not for all of you to leave this presentation as accessibility experts. I'm far from an expert myself. But instead, I'm hoping to give you some ideas that you can easily incorporate into your practice and help you create more accessible materials going forward. So first, what is accessibility? Accessibility doesn't have one common standard definition that everyone agrees upon, but I like to think of it as ensuring that everyone is able to access and interact with and benefit from a tool or resource regardless of any disability that they may have. Now, we often think of accessibility in terms of creating a good experience for users that might have physical disabilities. So perhaps they have vision impairments or hearing impairments. But accessibility also does entail um, helping out users that might have learning disabilities or other cognitive impairments or perhaps mental illness issues that might have an impact on how they're able to interact with materials. So all of those things are an important consideration and accessibility really is creating an equitable experience for everyone. Accessible technology specifically does have a really um, great definition that I like to use, which comes from Lazar, Goldstein and Taylor. Accessible technology is technology that can be utilized effectively by people with disabilities at the time they want to utilize the technology without modifications or accommodations. So today I'll be looking at how accessible technology intersects with library instruction. So with that in mind, let's think about why accessibility is important in the library instruction context. First, accessibility strongly relates to universal design for learning or UDL principles. Those of you that are attending from academic libraries today might already be familiar with this framework. For those of you who are not, the basic idea of UDL is that instructors should plan their lessons in such a way that they are going to work for learners who have different preferences, different learning styles, and different learning needs. We achieve that goal by providing multiple means of representation, so how we're conveying our content, multiple means of engagement, so how we're engaging with our students, how they're interacting with us, and how they're interacting with each other, and finally, multiple means of expression, so how students are able to show us that they understand the material. This strongly relates to accessibility 
because if we are going through the effort to provide multiple methods of showing our content and creating an experience that should work for everyone, this is only going to work for everyone if our materials are accessible. If certain users aren't able to access certain parts of our lesson, then we're not really benefiting from this universal design framework since it's only beneficial for some of our users. So accessibility is key um, to this framework. The next reason that accessibility is important for us is that librarians are teaching diverse learners. Libraries serve diverse communities, so we can expect that in any library classroom, we are going to have a variety of students from different backgrounds and that have different learning styles, preferences, and needs. Because of that, we always want to keep accessibility in mind. This is also important because instruction librarians are often operating based on limited knowledge of the classes that they'll be teaching. We so frequently find ourselves in this one-shot instruction environment where we are meeting students for the first time in a class. We might have some communication with a faculty member or another outside partner ahead of time to get a few details about who's in the room, but a lot of times we really just don't know who we're going to be teaching. So based on that, it's important for us to keep accessibility in mind to ensure we're reaching out to everyone because we might not always know ahead of time who is going to be in the room that has some sort of unique need that's going to influence their ability to interact with our materials. The next reason that accessibility is important in library instruction is that students are going to benefit from accessing your materials later, so we want to ensure that all of them are able to do that without any unnecessary barriers. Now, when I was originally planning to present this at LibTech in March, I was thinking of this in terms of the in-person classroom. So I was going to spend a lot of time here explaining to you why it's important for your PowerPoint to be accessible if it's something that you're just presenting to everyone live and you could perhaps verbally describe the elements on the slide, that type of thing. Now that we're in pandemic mode and many of us are planning online instruction for the fall, either as the majority of our instruction or in some cases, as in my library's case, it will be the only mode of um, instruction for us. It is obviously more important now than ever since many, if not all, students are going to be interacting with our materials in the digital environment only. However, you should still keep these considerations in mind in the future once we are all able to safely return to in-person environments. Because students can benefit from having access to things that you present in the classroom, works, worksheets you provide, and that sort of thing later on. As I've mentioned before, we're often working in this one-shot context where we see students once, possibly just for an hour, and that's really it. Because of that, we can't reasonably expect students to remember all of this great information that we're providing them with. But if we provide them access to our PowerPoint slides or other materials that we've created, then they're able to refer back to them later in the semester at specific points where they really need different pieces of information. So for that reason, we need to make sure that our materials are accessible so that all students are able to have that benefit regardless of any disability that they may have. And finally, and most importantly, accessibility is going to help everyone. We often think of accessibility in terms of how we can help users with disabilities, but accessibility improvements you make are going to create a better experience for other users as well. One example of this is closed captioning. I don't have any hearing impairments, but I prefer to turn on closed captioning when I'm watching educational videos because I find that having the text on the screen helps me retain my focus and remember the information better later on. Or perhaps I want to watch a video and I'm in a public place and I realize, oh no, I forgot my headphones and I don't want to bother the people around me. In that case, I could still watch the video just with the sound off and I could use those closed captioning so that I am still able to interact with those materials. So those are just a couple examples of why accessibility is important for everyone and not just users who have disabilities. The next segment of this presentation will be about general considerations for creating accessible materials. A lot of these guidelines come from the world of web accessibility, but I'm presenting them to you in a more general way that can be applied to many different types of files. I'll get into some specifics about how you can achieve some of these goals in particular programs later. But for now, I want to tell you a little bit about these different areas that you can keep in mind, regardless of what type of content you're creating. 
first, let's look at color. With color, the first thing that you wanna keep in mind is that you should never use color as the only means of conveying informational content. This is because many users are colorblind and there are plenty of people out there that are colorblind and might not even realize it, so they might not know that they're missing information. On the bottom of the screen, I have two images that reflect uh, what I mean by using color to convey content. These images are examples of the London subway map also known as the tube. The image on the left is what it looks like in color, and the image um, in the middle, so to the right of that colored image, is a black and white version. Now, since I don't have any issues perceiving color, I can read the map on the left just fine. I can look at that and see if I need to go from Piccadilly Circus to Oxford Circus, it looks like the brown line is what I need. If I weren't able to perceive color, then I then to me, it would look like that middle image where it's black and white. I can tell that there's a subway line that's going from Piccadilly Circus to Oxford Circus, but I can't tell which one it is because there's no sort of label. In the original, all it is is color. You could fix this issue by either creating some sort of text-based label for these lines. So next to the orange line, you could write the word orange or you could do a different type of visual indicator to differentiate between the lines. So perhaps the orange line would be represented as a dotted line. Maybe a different line would have a squiggly line or a dashed line or something like that. But if you're only relying on color to get your content across, then some of your users are going to be missing that informational content. The next consideration is that you should ensure that you have sufficient contrast between the text and the background. And I have an example of what you should avoid on the bottom right of this slide. Depending on how good your vision is, you may or may not be able to tell that that is an image that says visited link example. This actually comes from a Towson University branded PowerPoint. As I was creating a PowerPoint one day, I realized, oh, I typed in this hyperlink and there is almost no contrast between the text and the background. If you're not able to see it well, this image shows a really light gray background and then slightly darker gray text on top, but it's really hard to read even if you don't have any vision problems. So in this particular case, I noticed that this was a problem. I reached out to one of my colleagues who is far more knowledgeable about accessibility than I am, and she put me in touch with the person who could correct this issue and now it's been corrected. So if you use a Towson University branded PowerPoint, you will now see visited links with the proper amount of color contrast so you can actually read them. So that brings up a really important um, point that I don't want to forget to mention either, which is if you see these types of issues in the wild, so to speak, do speak up because if individuals don't hear about these issues, then they're not going to necessarily know that they exist, so no one can correct them. So please do say something if you notice this type of thing. The next general consideration I have for you is fonts. And first, let's think a little bit about font faces. Above all, you want to make sure that you're choosing a readable font. It might be fun to use a fancy frilly font like papyrus if you're into that sort of thing, but you should err away from using these really intricate fonts because you don't want to sacrifice readability for style. It's much more important that everyone is able to easily read your content than to have something that's really visually striking. You can also consider what type of font you use for different ways that users are interacting with your content. If you know that users are primarily going to be interacting with your materials in digital form, so on a screen, then you want to use a sans serif. There's an example of what sans serifs look like on the bottom left of this slide. They look like block letters and they don't have any frills or ornamentation on the edges. And this makes them easy to read on a computer screen. Common examples of sans serif fonts include things like Verdana, Calibri, or Arial. If you know that your students are going to be using your materials primarily in print form, then you may want to use a serif font. There's an example of that on the bottom right of this screen where you can see that you have those little detailed edges and that ornamentation there, which makes things easier to read and print. So you often see this type of font in any print book that you may have. Common types of serif fonts include Times New Roman and Georgia. 
In general, you also want to stick to standard tried and true fonts that users are likely to have on their devices. You might stumble across a really cool new font that you want to use for something and you download it on your computer. But if it's something you had to download, you can't assume that your users are going to be able to view that font. And instead, on their device, they might see it just as the default setting for their computer, which can really change thing the way that things are displayed. So in general, it might not be super exciting to use something like Arial or Times New Roman, but it's still worth the doing because it's going to enhance the readability of your content. Next, let's think about font size. So the really important part here is to make sure you're choosing a font size that's big enough to be readable. This is especially important in the in-person setting. For example, if you have a PowerPoint presentation in front of a live audience that, that are just in the classroom with you, you need to make sure that those at the back of the room are able to see what's on your screen because they're not able to make any adjustments on what's happening on your screen. As the presenter, you have sole control over that, so you want to make sure that things are big enough to be readable. In other cases, if it's material that um, students are viewing on their own devices, then they have the power to magnify text as needed, and some users are just always going to magnify text based on any visual impairments they may have. That's totally fine. But if the average user or if the majority of your users are going to have to magnify your text and make some adjustments in order to read it, that's an indication to you that it is too small. Now, you may notice that I split this font section up into two slides. I could have squeezed all of it onto one slide if I really wanted to, but that would have made the text really small. So here's kind of an example of applying this concept. I split things into different slides to enhance readability so that I could have um, larger text here. Next, let's talk about images. Images can be a great help in presentations, but there are some things that you need to keep in mind when you're going to use them. First, you should avoid text-based images. Sometimes when you're browsing social media, so maybe you see a Twitter post or an Instagram post, you'll see an image that's really just text on some sort of colorful background. You should avoid using these types of images because users who need to magnify them might try to do that and find that the text is distorted when they do that. If you present that same information in text-based form instead of an image, then it's going to magnify properly. Just the regular font size is going to increase. There won't be any issues there. But when it becomes an image, then you don't have that same type of control. Another important consideration is that you should always add alternative text when you are including images. Alternative text, it will be read by a screen reader. So someone who is blind and accessing your content and isn't able to see anything would use the screen reader and then they would hear in their screen reader what you've put in that alternative text section. So really it's an alternative to an image that's describing what other people would visually see. In some cases, you might be using a, pure, a purely decorative image. In that case, you don't need to go through the effort of describing it since someone wouldn't be losing out on informational content without seeing it, but you should still include what we call the empty alt for it, where in your alt text, you just put quote, end quote, and that is going to alert the user that yes, there's an image there, but they're not missing out on anything. Whereas if you don't have that empty alt at all, they'll see that there's nothing there and be kind of confused and not sure if that was an intentional omission or if there's content there that they're missing out on, but whoever created it didn't go through the effort of putting in the alternative text. The next consideration um, is something that I keep in mind a lot of the time because as a librarian, I use lots of screenshots. If you're using screenshots or if you just have other large images where you're trying to alert users to a particular part of that image, it's really helpful to crop out any unnecessary detail. So users can easily find what they're looking for within that image and you're reducing any type of background noise. So perhaps you're trying to teach students about different filters in one of your databases. In that case, you could do a screenshot but then crop out that screenshot. So all it's displaying is the particular database filters that you want to draw attention to. And then perhaps you could also annotate that image 
and maybe draw a box around or add some explanatory text that would call attention to the filters that you think are going to be really useful for your students. Then verbally in your presentation or in the surrounding text, if it's some other type of document, you could describe how to get to those filters. And then the image itself is really condensed just to that key information. And finally with images, don't rely too heavily on them. They are definitely useful to break up text-based content and because there are lots of visual learners out there who really appreciate them, but don't rely on adding images just for the sake of having images because they can be really visually distracting for folks and detract from your main content. And on that note, now let's talk about language or the actual content of your instruction materials. It's really important to use clear, concise language, especially for users that have learning disabilities or cognitive impairments. But really everyone is going to benefit if you take a lot of care and attention to provide your materials clearly and to focus on the main details that you want students to take away without overwhelming them with more content than they really need to know. You also want to avoid unnecessary library jargon or terminology that's really common within our field, but that your students may never have heard before. It's really tempting to always use that technically correct term, but it's going to be easier for users to understand your content if you stick to terminology or vocabulary that's more common to their everyday speech. For example, I talk about Boolean operators quite a lot in the courses that I work with regularly, but I only ever use the word Boolean if I'm working with a class of computer science students who I can reasonably assume have heard that terminology before and based on their disciplinary context. It's also really important to keep things short. I know I've already mentioned this, but it's worth reiterating. This is really difficult in the library instruction content, uh, context because as librarians, we have all of this great information that we want to share with students and we want them to have every last detail that's going to give them a better experience, but they're not going to remember everything that we tell them, nor do we want to overwhelm them. There are some cases where we are just being asked to cover a ton of material in a short amount of time and there's no great way around that. In that case, it's really useful to chunk your content into smaller sections to help your learners understand things better. So maybe you're doing a lecture-based presentation. In that case, you can have clear visual indicators that you're moving from section to section. You can focus on really organizing your content in a clear, understandable way. And you can verbally describe when you're going from one section to another. So I might tell my students, Okay, now we're done with our portion of today's section or session on evaluating sources. In the next 20 minutes, we're going to talk about searching library databases, something like that to help students follow you as you go along. If you're providing asynchronous online content, it's also super useful to split your content into smaller sections. So perhaps you want to do some sort of voiceover of a PowerPoint recording for your class rather than recording an hour long video of you talking over a PowerPoint, it's a lot more effective to split that up into a series of shorter videos or activities. So if you've divided your PowerPoint into different sections, then you could do one like five or 10 minute video on that first section, cut it off there, and then students can navigate through those different sections at their own pace. Splitting that into sections also can help students pause and reflect on their learning um, much more easily than they could if you have this hour long thing that they're viewing all at once. And it's also a good opportunity to encourage students to um, practice their own learning. So a lot of times when I'm creating an asynchronous lesson, I'll start by having students view a video and then I'll instruct them to go complete some sort of short activity that shows that they are able to apply the concept in that video. So that's a really helpful thing to do as well. Next, let's talk about mobile accessibility. This is another point or, or area where back as I was planning this in March, I knew I was going to have to spend a little bit of time here explaining why mobile accessibility is important if people are working with you in person, possibly in a computer lab. But now that we're in pandemic mode, 
I don't think I need to do as much persuading here as to why mobile accessibility is important because we can reasonably assume that some of our students are going to be viewing our instruction materials on a cell phone either as their only method of doing their um, educational activities or because that's simply their preference but even in the in-person environments there are tons of times where I've been working with students in a computer lab and I've seen that some of them are trying to search databases on their phone instead just because that's what they prefer to use so with that in mind, it's important to take a look at your instruction materials and see what they look like when viewed on a cell phone, a tablet, or any other mobile device you have at your disposal, and to make any changes that are necessary to create a better experience for students who are interacting with your content in the mobile environment. If you've created a really great resource and it's not displaying properly, but you don't feel like you could really um, make some edits to easily make it mobile accessible. In that case, you could consider creating a separate mobile-friendly version of a resource, something that has a smaller file size, maybe it doesn't contain as many images, maybe you rely more on text as opposed to images, just to ensure that users who prefer to interact with your content that way or do so out of necessity are still able to benefit from it in a similar way to students who might be viewing your content on a computer. Next, let's think about how we present these materials that we've created. So once again, I was conceiving this presentation more in terms of the in-person instruction context, but looking back at what I've prepared here, a lot of these different ideas do apply to the online environments, and you can certainly keep them in mind once we return to in-person instruction in the future as well. So the first consideration is to speak clearly and don't turn your back to the audience when speaking. Turning your back to the audience probably is not going to be a problem for you when you're teaching online, but in the online environment, you can make sure that you're speaking into your microphone, that your microphone is actually on, and you can also um, consider using a headset or an external microphone as opposed to something that's built in on your computer because that often creates clearer audio. Next, if you're presenting video content, you should turn on the closed captioning while you're presenting it. And I personally avoid videos that don't have closed captioning, just in case there's someone in my class that either needs that closed captioning in order to get the content or simply prefers to have it there. If you're creating your own videos, I highly recommend that you caption those as well. Depending on what platform you are using to create or host your videos, captions may be created automatically for you, or it's possible that your institution um, partners with some sort of organization that does captioning if you request it. So if that's something that's available to you, definitely take advantage. I personally upload my instruction videos to YouTube, which does create automatic captions. And then I always take time after the fact to go in and edit those captions. YouTube captions do a pretty good job capturing um, content well, but they don't contain um, punctuation, for example, and you'll always see little errors. For example, I always have to go in and correct the spelling of my first name, though that's not unique to YouTube, that's just a lifelong struggle. But there will be little errors that are in there that would be really helpful for you to correct if you can. Next, when you are actually providing your instruction, it's important to verbally describe key features of visual elements so that people who are having difficulty seeing things are still getting that content just in a different way. It's also useful to provide electronic and print versions of materials whenever possible. This, of course, applies more to the in-person context, but also making sure that you have printer-friendly versions of materials is important since some students may prefer to print things out and read them compared to viewing everything on a screen. Now, a lot of times I will be asked to create a print handout or a worksheet that students can fill out and turn in to their instructor for participation points. In that case, I do like to provide them with an electronic form as well, just in case they prefer that, and also because then they have something to refer back to later if they're not able to hold on to that sheet of paper for an entire semester. Finally, it's useful to provide a handout or an approximate transcript of your content as appropriate. You'll notice that I've done that for this presentation. I gave you that link at the top 
so that you can refer back to um, that information later on. I will readily admit that while I think that creating a transcript is a best practice, it's something that I personally don't always have the time to do. Since, as I mentioned before, I'm not great at speaking from a script, creating a script is not usually part of my normal process. If you're someone like that and you're creating a video, then if you create captions for it, you could use those captions as your transcript later on. But having another way for users to interact with your content is really helpful, both for individuals that just don't learn well from videos or for individuals who might be sick of watching all of these videos and could be experiencing Zoom or WebEx fatigue, which I'm sure we can all relate to on some level in the current environment. All right, so how do we make these materials available to students? First and foremost, you should think about where students are likely to look for them. If you put them in a place that they're used to going and looking for materials, then they're more likely to find them than if you've hidden them on some far corner of the internet. It's useful to create a short link, so something like a bit.ly or a tiny URL link. And if you're in the in-person classroom and you have physical handouts and things like that, it's useful to include that link there. So students are able to easily uh, refer back to that, type in the link without having a super long URL so they can find your content again later. If your library uses LibGuides or if there's something comparable on your library website, that's another great place to make your materials available. For most of the courses that I work with, I create a course guide on our LibGuides platform, and I always stick my PowerPoint slides, worksheets, any other supplemental materials I've created there so that students can find them later. It's, always, um, it's also really useful to put materials on course management software if you have access to it. At Towson, we use Blackboard, so whenever I have Blackboard access for a class, I will stick my materials there. Even in addition to that LibGuide that I've created, because students are very used to going to Blackboard, looking for their educational content there. That's just a normal part of their practice. So in a lot of cases, they're more likely to find them there than they would be searching through the library website. And finally, if you don't have access to these other things, if you do have the email addresses of your learners, then you could email files to them that way so they can um, keep track of them on their own. And in general, if you can do more than one of these things, that's great. If there's just one that makes the most sense for your context, that's fine too. But making sure that students have access to the materials after you're done teaching is super important. All right, so now that I've given you a lot of information about things that you can keep in mind, regardless of what type of content you're creating, now let's think more about specifics for document accessibility. Now, there are tons of different file types that you could be using in your instruction in the interest of time and just in the uh, and just because it would be impossible to cover every single possible file type that's out there, I'm going to focus on some really common ones that are useful both in instruction and just in the world of libraries in general and give you a few tips and guidelines about these particular types. We'll start with Microsoft Word. The first step towards creating an accessible Word document is to use its built-in title and heading structure, which is going to create some semantic information for users and is going to help individuals using screen readers navigate through your content. Using these built-in titles and headings is also going to benefit everyone by creating a clickable table of contents. Now this table of contents does not appear by default. You have to go to the view menu and then the navigation pane, and that is going to display your table of contents. So that's something that's useful for everyone and not just um, users with disabilities. So remember that accessibility is helping us all. To create these titles and headings, you will type in your title or your section title, that type of thing, highlight it, and then on the home menu, you should see a styles box similar to the screenshot that I have on the bottom of the screen. 
and then you can select the appropriate heading level. So if we were title, you'll click on title, it's going to reformat your text, and then it's going to apply that semantic information so your computer knows this is the title. If you're creating a heading, it's the same type of thing. Just select heading one if it's a top level heading. If it's a subsection, then use heading level two. Just make sure you always go in order and don't skip over heading levels. What you also want to avoid doing is using these different styles just because you think that they look nice. So maybe you're really attached to the way heading four looks and you wanna format your text that way. Don't use heading four unless you are actually trying to make something heading four because that would create some incorrect semantic information in your documents that's going to cause problems for some of your users. Here's an example of what your document may look like if you apply these headings. So you'll see that the default setting for the title is just going to be large black text. Top level heading is smaller blue text. The next level heading is also blue text, but a little bit smaller. And then all of the explanatory text is fairly small and in black. And on the left side of the screenshot, you have this clickable navigation menu, where if I clicked on the title of any of those, if I was in the Word document, then it would take me directly to that section of the paper. Now, if you're not really enthused by this default formatting, you can still apply these headings, but format your text differently. All you have to do is add that heading, highlight your text, reformat it the way you want, and then if you right click on it, there should be an option for you to apply that formatting to that heading level throughout the document. So if I made an adjustment to what my heading one looked like in one place, it should automatically update throughout the document. So you can still use the semantic information even if you don't like the default formatting. Next, if you are including any images in your Word document, you should include alt text. This is super easy to do. All you need to do is right click on the image, a drop down menu will appear, and there will be an option to edit the alt text. A box will then appear on the right side of your screen, which gives you some space to enter in your alt text. Remember to keep it short and sweet. Focus just on the information that you want your students to gain from that image. So in this case, I have an image of a screenshot from a search result in Google Scholar. What I'm hoping students gain from this image is um, learning how to view other articles that have cited a given article. So in the image itself, you may notice that I've put a box around the cited by link. And in the alt text, I describe where that cited by link is. I don't describe other details about that image because they're not relevant to the topic at hand. So focus on what you really want people to get from that image when you're writing out text. Microsoft Word also has an accessibility checker that you can use. Now note that this is a built-in computer-generated accessibility check, so it's not perfect, but it is really useful to alert you to certain errors. You can access it from the file menu in Word, then click on check for issues, and then select check accessibility from the drop-down menu. If it doesn't catch any problems, it'll have a nice green check mark for you that will say no accessibility issues found. If there are issues, it might alert you to images that are missing alt text. It might tell you that you haven't applied your headings in the correct order and that type of thing so you can check it. But it's not going to be able to check for a lot of those general considerations I already gave you. It's not going to know if you're using color as the only means of conveying content for some example. So definitely use it as an alert system for you but don't rely on it as the only method of checking accessibility because it's not going to catch everything. Next, let's talk about PowerPoint. And a lot of these ideas do apply to um, Google Slides or other presentation software as well. First, you want to choose an easily readable theme. There are a lot of built-in themes in Microsoft Word that you can apply, but not all of them are accessible. You want to make sure you choose one that has sufficient contrast between the text and the background and that doesn't have a visually distracting background. Now you don't need to limit yourself to dark gray text on a white background like I have here. Feel free to do things that are a little bit more visually interesting, but make sure that they're still readable above all. That's the most important thing. 
Unfortunately, not all of the themes in Microsoft Word or Google Slides fit that criteria, so choose them wisely. When you're creating each slide, you should use the predefined layouts and avoid adding extra content boxes when possible. So if you know that your slide is going to have text on one side and an image on the other, select the two content option rather than selecting just the regular one content box option and then adding in the image separate later. This is a similar idea to those headings in Microsoft Word. It's just going to provide a little bit more semantic information about what's going on on the slide. And it's going to help make sure that screen readers are um, picking up your content in the correct order. You should also use unique slide titles for each of your slides. So you'll note that throughout this presentation, I've split up content in a, into a few different slides in several cases. For example, rather than calling this slide just PowerPoint, I'm giving it a more descriptive label so that you're able to tell what information about PowerPoint I'm giving you. If you were to just call four slides in a row PowerPoint, that would really um, hinder users' ability to navigate through your content and find what they're really looking for. As an alternative to providing a more descriptive kind of sub-label, you could label them with a number. So this could be PowerPoint 1 or PowerPoint 2, and that's going to um, reduce confusion for folks. The next thing that you want to do with PowerPoints is to check the reading order of slides, which I've alluded to already. Reading order is the order that a screen reader is going to read the different content items on your slide. You can access this from the home menu in PowerPoint, click on the arrange icon, which appears towards the middle, and then click on selection pane, which I have an example of on the next slide here. Now, for some really strange reason, screen readers are going to read this from bottom to top. So whatever occurs on the bottom of the list on the selection pane, in this case, it's title one, is what the screen reader is going to read first. Then it will read whatever is above that and so forth until it gets to the end. So make sure that you're going from bottom to top and check that those content items are being read in the order that you intend them to be. So you would want the title to be first. If you have multiple content items, make sure it's reading them in a logical order. So maybe you have an image with a caption under it. You wanna make sure that it's reading any alt text that you have for the image before it reads the caption so that it makes sense for users. Next, let's talk about images or other effects that you can use in PowerPoint. As in Microsoft Word or any other program, you want to make sure you're adding alternative text. It's the same process here as it was in Word. Just right click, edit alt text, you're good to go. You also want to avoid something called smart art. I have an example of what smart art looks like on the bottom right of this slide. Smart art is often used to create visually interesting tables and graphics where you have a combination of text, maybe some shapes, lots of color, just makes things look a little bit prettier. These look fantastic. Unfortunately, they're not picked up by screen readers, which is really bizarre to me because they are a mixture of text and actual visual content. But for some reason, reason, screen readers aren't going to pick up on the text that you have typed in there. It just ignores it completely. It doesn't even alert the user that smart art is there. If you're really attached to your smart art, as an alternative, you could create it in your PowerPoint slide take a screenshot when it's done, crop that screenshot in Microsoft Paint or whatever editing software you like to use, and then save that as an image, which you can provide without text that would contain that textual information that you want users to get. That way, a screen reader could read that alt text, but if you're just using the smart art itself, screen reader users won't even know that it's there, which is unfortunate. Finally, it is best to avoid animations whenever possible because these can also mess with reading order and related issues for screen reader users. A lot of instructors, myself included, like to use the appear animation during an instruction session. So maybe I'm asking students several different discussion questions, but I don't want them all to appear at once. Unfortunately, if I give students a PowerPoint that has that feature involved, 
a lot of times this is going to cause the screen reader to read the same content multiple times. So if we're at the fourth discussion question, it might not just read that fourth question, it might read one through four again, even though they've already heard those previous questions. If you want to use this feature in your instruction, by all means do so, but I would recommend that you create an alternative version of your PowerPoint to share with students that doesn't have these animations. So you can benefit during the live presentation, but then when students go back to access it later, they're not going to run into that unnecessary issue. Then finally for PowerPoint with content, always best to stick to short bullet points so users aren't distracted trying to read long paragraphs of text while you're speaking. It's also useful to limit the amount of content per slide just to make sure that everything is really readable and users aren't distracted. And as I've mentioned before, consider creating a transcript so that users have something to refer back to and don't simply have to remember what verbal content you use to supplement the limited um, amount of information that you have on each slide. Like Microsoft Word, PowerPoint does have an accessibility checker, which you can access in the file menu, hit info, check for issues, and then there's an accessibility checker option there as well. In my experience, it will almost always give you an alert, which isn't necessarily going to be a bad thing. It just reminds you to check certain things. If you have added content boxes anywhere, it's going to tell you to check the reading order, which is a good reminder, but you can't dismiss that notification. So there are a lot of cases where the accessibility checker is never going to tell you that things are perfect, but it's still a useful reminder for you. Now let's very briefly talk about the PDF formats. In general, I avoid PDFs because they generally aren't the most accessible file format and they're not perceived to be the most accessible file format by users with disabilities. You can create somewhat accessible PDFs, but that accessibility is largely influenced by the file formats that you use to create that original document. So if you went through all of those steps to create an accessible Microsoft Word document and then you saved it as a PDF, the resulting PDF would probably be fairly accessible, but it's not going to be more accessible than the Word document that you created. So that's something to keep in mind as well. It is possible to remediate some accessibility issues within a PDF itself without returning to that original file. For example, programs like Adobe um, Acrobat DC, I believe, have this functionality, but these are still imperfect and they do require some expertise, which I personally lack, unfortunately. Also, because PDFs are known to contain a lot of accessibility issues, some users with disabilities will see that something is a PDF and simply not open it because they assume outright that it's not going to be accessible. So on that level, it may not even be worth it to go through the effort of creating an accessible PDF because no one is going to see it anyway. So I recommend avoiding PDFs if at all possible. If it's content that you've created, share the original file format instead. Of course, we can't avoid these entirely in our lives because if we were to avoid PDFs entirely, then we would not have access to a good number of the databases that are out there. But in your own instruction, this is something that you can have control over. So if you, if you can avoid PDFs, if at all possible, that would be my recommendation to you. Then let's talk a little bit about Google Docs, Google Slides, etc. I'm kind of lumping all of these together for one key reason, and that's that they unfortunately are less accessible in general than Microsoft products. They do have some accessibility features that you can use. For example, you can add alternative text, same way as in Microsoft Word, it's just a simple right click. Something um, you may have noticed throughout this presentation is that I am using Google Slides this time. There are two reasons for that. The first is that the conference I was originally going to present this at recommended that we use Google Slides so that we could use um, its live captioning feature, which I have enabled here for you today. The other reason is that with Google Documents, it's really easy to share those links with folks and they'll be able to access them later. In a lot of scenarios, students are already going to be really familiar with Google Docs and Google Slides. They don't require any type of extra download, so that helps make them accessible. But unfortunately, these products just don't have as many tools that you can use as a content creator to enhance their accessibility. 
They also don't have any built-in accessibility checkers like Microsoft Word does. There are some um, add-ons or browser extensions you can use, but these are run through third parties, so that's something to keep in mind. And with Google products, users will have to manually turn on screen reader support for it to work for them, whereas that's just a default setting for Microsoft Word. If you want to turn on screen reader support in Google um, products, you can go to the tools menu in whatever type of file you have and enter the accessibility settings, and that's going to give you certain options. As you might expect, Google products work best if you're using the Chrome browser compared to other ones. So certain options such as screen magnification only appear in Google Chrome. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Okay, so this has been a lot of information. I hope I haven't overwhelmed you too much. And I would like to reiterate that my goal here isn't for you all to panic and think, oh no, there are all these problems with my materials, whatever am I going to do? Instead, Focus on what you can do to improve your practice going forward, and remember that any improvement you make is going to have a real impact on your users. Try not to make too many assumptions, so don't assume, oh, there's no blind student in this class, so I don't have to worry about adding alternative text, because remember that accessibility benefits everyone. Going forward, rather than overwhelming yourself trying to correct errors in previously made materials, maybe you want to focus on the new materials that you create. So making sure that you're designing things with accessibility in mind, that you're always adding alt text to new materials that you create. You can try doing some accessibility testing on your most used resources. So if you have access to a screen reader, then you might see what that experience is like and make sure that um, content isn't being missed. You can also research the accessibility of tools, programs, and other resources that you teach your students how to use so that you can empathize with your user and also perhaps reconsider um, pointing your students towards resources that you know are not going to work for certain populations. You can also be an advocate for accessibility in your organization. I know that we have a wide variety of individuals here with different roles and different types of libraries. All of you have some sort of power. Please use it for good. So this might mean that in your role, maybe it makes sense for you to, uh, um, to um, educate other staff about accessibility. Maybe you want to give your own accessibility presentation at a conference or give a webinar or something like that. But really think about how you can share this knowledge and use it to improve the practices of your library as a whole. So on that note, on this slide, because I'm a librarian and I can't help myself, I've listed a couple related topics that you can explore if you want more information about accessibility. And then because I never in my life have been able to fit a full reference list onto a single PowerPoint slide, I have three of those for you for additional resources that you can consult both to help you make more accessible documents and get more information in this area. All right, so thank you once again for being here. That was a lot of information, and I am excited to answer any questions that you may have, either now or later on. My inbox is always open. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was that was awesome. Um, I took a bunch of notes <laughs> myself. <laughs> Wonderful. About things. Um, I think it was great. So, so yes. First, if everybody has any questions or comments or thoughts, um, type them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, I'll grab them off there and read them off um, for Elizabeth to answer. And of course, you know, as she said, you can reach out to her at any time you want to. Um, it is officially 11 a.m. Central Time, uh, but we will continue uh, with our show here and with answering any questions you have, as long as it takes to get through all of them. And for Elizabeth to answer anything you want to say, we won't get cut off just because it's hit the top of the hour again. Not a problem. So please do go ahead and type in your questions so we can answer them. Um, we do have a, some, some very helpful information. Thank you, of course. Yes, I agree. <laughs> um, and let's... Yes, and once again, please do feel free to share these slides and the transcript and any other information with your colleagues or with anyone that you think may be interested. Because this is an important topic and I would love for you to share the knowledge with anyone that could benefit. Yeah, and as I said in the beginning of this, if you weren't here, um, <clears throat> we are recording the show um, and it will be available to every, all of you by the end of this week. Um, and our show, our recordings and everything are free and open to anyone to watch. So share, 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 send people to our site. <laughs> um, and I will have a link directly to the slides. And as Liz, if you, Elizabeth showed you those last three years, share slow slides, slides with all of those um, 
reading lists and the other things, don't worry about writing all that down. You'll be able to click on them right from the slides when you have access to them. Yeah, if you go to that you know, website right there. So we do have some questions that have been coming in. Yes. Um, <laughs> Thanks so much. All right, so much to know. Um, we were talking about um, captioning in YouTube, and uh, well, we do use YouTube to post our recordings for Encompass Live. So it does. I do know it. I, that's why I, I like it too for the closed captionings. People have always asked me about, do you do that for the shows? And I was like, not for the live shows, but for the recording, it'll be there mm -hmm. automatically. And it is. Uh, I've. The editing does need to be done afterwards, and I've always had, like I said, it's always been trouble for me to have the time to go back and refix all of the mistakes, potentially. Um, my name being one of the things that is typically never done correctly. Um, <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but they are there, um, and I've, you know, glanced through some of them quickly to start investigating them, and as far as the basic content, that seems to work great. It's things like when I say Encompass Live, it does not know what that is. <laughs> um, right, you know, yeah, I find it, with database names and things like yeah, that, it can make yes, lots so. of errors too. So they're definitely a really great starting point and they save you so much time um, compared to creating something from scratch. Yes. But yes, whenever you have the time and the capacity to go in and edit those, that's really yeah. going to yeah. I think it's maybe help. 80 to 90% accurate depending on the content and what's been said, yeah. Um, but someone does want to know, do you know about if captioning is available on Facebook Live? A lot of libraries have been using that as part for their um, you know, story times and, and events and things now. That's a really great question that I don't know the answer to. Unfortunately, I'm not really a Facebook power user, but... Mm -hmm. I will definitely look into that. And um, if you want to send me that question via email, I'd be happy to follow up with you on it. Or if someone wants to be really industrious right now and do a quick Google search for Facebook Live captioning and give us an answer right now, that would be <laughs> useful too. And that's always um, my single biggest piece of tech advice for folks. If you just give a clear Google search for whatever yeah. issue you're having, maybe include like what type of browser you're using, that type of thing. A lot of times you can find the answer that way. I, I just did the Google. I just Googled Facebook live captioning. And the first thing that comes up from Facebook.com is enabling closed captions on Facebook live broadcasts. With this update, users using the live API can now add um, CEA 608 standard closed captions to Facebook live, et cetera, yeah, anyway, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, goes on and on. Um, this was, um, this is back from 2017. So apparently, yes, but it is something it looks like that needs to be enabled. So um, search for it. You should be able to find information about how to do that uh, somewhere online. Um, from, Excellent. From Thank you for looking into that. Yeah. I just did a quick Google search. Yeah. That's how the beginnings yeah, of the like being We can find the answers to <laughs> such things, right? <laughs> um, and okay, now Sarah Summers says, thanks for a great presentation. I think I missed this for PowerPoints. Why do you say not to repeat the slide headings? So um, part of that is for clarity and part of it is also for navigation. So screen readers can get confused if you have multiple things with the same title. And also just if a user is clicking through your PowerPoints on their own without using a screen reader, it might be confusing if you had five different slides that all had that same title when they're looking for a more specific piece of information. So that's why I like to kind of give things more descriptive labels than just the broad topic at hand. Mm -hmm. So try, that's, that's sort of what, related to what you talked about, about breaking up your information, even your content into smaller bits, do the same thing when you're creating your slides. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and we do have someone that did clarify, I should have been reading this while I, I was Googling instead of looking at the questions. Someone does say about um, doing uh, captions in Facebook Live, captions are available, turn them on when you start the feed. So right when you start, there should be something there to turn it on and it will start doing it for you right built into there. Excellent. And um, I didn't yeah. mention this, but you may have noticed that I have captions enabled for my Google slides. So it's automatically updating those as I speak. That's something that's really easy to do in Google slides, but you have to be using Chrome. It doesn't appear for other browsers. So when you start your presentation, there will be all of these options that appear at the bottom left of your screen. And if you're in Chrome, one of those will be a closed caption box <clears throat> that you can click on. And then it starts and does all the work for you. And it's right, you can see it live in action right in front of you, right here, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, all right, so here's a long one here. Um, okay, are there any applications other than Word 
or Google Docs for creating accessible handouts that you have encountered or would recommend. Thinking about how to best make digital handouts. I use Canva and turn them into PDFs. Obviously, def, as we know, definitely not the most accessible. I wasn't aware of the PDF accessibility issues before this. Yeah, that's a great question. So Digital handouts come, are, can be different than like a Word document, so yeah. Right. In my experience, I tend to stick to Microsoft Word and to a lesser extent um, Google Documents. This is something that we're, I've tried to research a bit this summer as I'm planning for a fully online instruction season this fall, but I haven't found any other really great programs for it, in, um, unfortunately. So if you're creating something um, with Canva, if it's something like an infographic, then you could consider providing that PDF to students, but then also provide some explanatory text with it. So something that contains all of that same information just in plain text format for those that have trouble um, getting that content from a PDF file. Yeah, and I know so a lot of times the answer is really just providing different formats for the same information. Because we've all been told, and it's true, um, visuals grab people. That's why people started doing infographics, not just here's my text report about the statistics from the last year, but here's the cool pictures that will catch your attention to your stakeholders or your, you know, your administration or whatever. Um, but still make that version of it that is just the text for the people that may need it that way. Absolutely. Yeah, these are very valuable tools and by all means you should use them, but you do need to take some time to consider how all users are going to be able to interact with it. Mm. And now here's a good question. This is something that I was wondering about too. Um, someone else is asking about the whole PDFs issue. I tend to use PDFs to prevent the documents from being edited after the fact. And that's, that's what I think of them that as well too. It's locked down. Nobody can change it and then change what you've presented, it's sent out there. Would locking the Word file to prevent edits hamper the screen reading? Ah, okay. So lock the, can, you know you can lock the Word file, but how does, would that have any effect on a screen reader? So I can't speak for certain, um, but I don't believe that that would have any um, hindrance for a screen reader because it should still be able to pick up on any semantic content or alt text or things like that that you've added. Yeah. One potential issue there is that if someone wants to increase the font size of things, or maybe you've used a font that they just don't like for whatever reason, then they would, if they're not able to edit it, they wouldn't have the ability to go in on their own and kind of highlight all the text and reformat it the way that they want. But if it's not totally locked down and they're still able to copy and paste the text, then they could grab that, stick it into another document and do what they want to do. So it shouldn't be an issue just to access the content itself, mm -hmm. but locking it down could create um, that type of additional barrier. Mm -hmm. But in that case, I think it would still be a better overall experience than um, using a PDF. Yeah, you gotta decide what you really want your end result, yeah, to be, yeah. Um, <clears throat> now here's an interesting video uh, question about videos, which I've seen a lot of these too. Um, what about video that doesn't have any voiceover? Is there a way to make, how do you make those more accessible? We've been posting videos that are just demonstrations with the music over it. So for those, you can create some visual descriptions of the content, or you could create some sort of text-based alternative. This is actually something that we're working on in our library. We're looking to um, update a lot of our YouTube videos for this fall, and I know there's at least one of them that I'll be working on that has that um, same type of content where it has some music in the background, but there's no actual verbal description. I would say when you're creating your materials, it is best to have both um, audio and visuals to ensure that everyone is going to interact with them. Mm -hmm. But if you already have something, you don't have the ability to kind of add on that voiceover after the fact, then I think creating a text-based alternative where you clearly explain the elements that you hope your um, users are going to gain from that content, that's mm -hmm. going to be super important so that there's some way that they can get that information and it's not just completely inaccessible to a certain group of people. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some demo videos that the audio is just music, but there is then um, text over the on the video itself that talks about you know some you know what they're doing at that step. You know, click here, do they, so you could have that you know for reading and then for screen reading potentially. So um, some people have done you know not just the music, but 
Right. Okay. Yeah. It's just that, yeah, you run into problems where the only text that you have is on the screen. It's not verbally described because then if someone can't see, then they're not getting any of that content because there isn't um, any alternative for them. So they're not able to hear it with a screen reader. Yeah. So would a screen reader, if for, would a screen reader be able to pick up text in a video or no? If it's just text on the screen, then no, because yeah. it would not be um, looking at that type of content. Because, you know, it's in the original file that you uploaded. It's not kind of in the video player itself, if you get what I mean. Right, right. So it's just like what we were just talking about previously. You're going to need to do, to get that information out, that demonstration out, you're going to have to do it in multiple formats, multiple ways, Correct. if you're going to cover want to cover everybody who may potentially be um, looking at it. Right, well, which is a general best practice too, because as I talked about before with the um, UDL framework, different users are going to have different preferences for how to engage with materials. So not only is that ensuring that everyone can use your materials, but it's also giving format options just for people that have simple preferences. Mm -hmm. And people learn different, better, differently. Some people learn better watching videos. Some people learn better reading. It, yeah, exactly. Um, also, here we have a question about fonts. I remember a study that asserted that readers retained more with a serif font. Curious about issues with sans serif online. Does the benefit of readability outweigh comprehension? I don't know. Interesting. I would um, be really interested to hear that study because that's not something that I have heard before. So that's something, since I haven't heard of that before, I can't speak intelligently about kind of weighing those benefits, mm -hmm. but with font faces, you know, there isn't just one easy answer to that type of thing because there are lots of scenarios where individuals could be viewing your content digitally or in print form. For example, students may view your PowerPoint as you're presenting it to them live, but a lot of students like to print out handout versions of their PowerPoints to take notes on, right? So okay. in that case, I you do. can choose one or the other and it might be a slightly better experience in one context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting, something to look into, yeah. Um, all right, so now we have another question here. What advice do you have about adding alt text? What advice do you have for adding alt text for complex images, like an organizational chart, a concept mat, map, et cetera? So, I mean, the one that you showed an example was, there's a lot to that image, but the one thing you were focusing on is the only thing you described. What if there's more complex images? Hmm. Oh, no. Uh oh, all right. It appears we may have lost Elizabeth. Uh, ah, oh, no. Oh, I think she might have lost her connection. I'm sorry. Um, I'm so sorry. I think that I lost my internet connection for a moment. Can you hear me again? Yep, you're back. Yep, no problem. Yep. Sorry about that. A brief little hiccup. That's okay. And your screen's still yeah, I guess up. we're all pretty used to that at this point in time, aren't we? <laughs> yes, yes. And nobody panic, so it's all good. Yes. Yep, just a brief <laughs> little hiccup. No problem. You're back. Um, so we had a question. I'm not sure who was, I was asking the question about adding alt text. Um, what advice do you have for adding alt text for complex images, like an organizational chart or a concept map? Um, I guess something more complex than the example that you had shown where the citation was there, but you just described the part that you were talking about that was the important bit. Right. I think in that case, your best approach would be to treat it more um, like something like an infographic where you're creating just a text description of everything that's there. Because alt text works really well just for short descriptions. But if it's something where it's really an image that has just text-based content, providing that just as basic text elsewhere is going to be a lot easier for um, readers to interact with. Alt text might isn't always the best option for things that are images necessarily. It's going to depend. Right. So in that case, you might give in the alt text kind of a brief description of what it is, just so users know there's an image here. This is an organizational chart. But then you might want to um, have some sort of alternative 
text version available somewhere that you alert them to that's going to provide more information because in right. general I'll text document is that just in text has here's all here's the organization chart and how it is breaking yeah. down breaks down yeah makes sense yeah, absolutely all right um that was the last question that i saw up um does anybody have any other questions or comments or suggestions or anything you want to share right now um before we do wrap up we're almost at about 20 after 11 so i think it might be a good time to wrap things up i'm just you thank who's in thanks so much for the presentation great information i think people Absolutely. have a lot thank of thank you for having me yeah a lot of things to think about um now for what they think about what we've been doing and what we could be doing um, um better in the future yeah all right, so if anybody has any desperate questions you need to ask right now, get them typed in before we do wrap things up. I'll give you a couple seconds to do that. I can't see the way this system works if anyone's in the middle of typing. I won't see it until you get your information up there, but that's okay. Yep, and if you think of something five hours from now, feel free to email me too. Absolutely. Yes. at Towson.edu. Pretty easy to remember. Absolutely. Reach out to Elizabeth. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, doesn't look like anybody has any desperate questions they want to ask right now. Awesome. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. This was, as I said, great information. Some things I've been doing, some things I knew about. Like I said, I took notes, some things I think I'm going to have to get more focused on. I got to do that editing of my captions. I know it. I know it's always in the back of my mind. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to pull presenter control back to my screen here so we can, I can wrap things up. All right. All right. So thank you everybody for um, being with us this morning. Thank you, Elizabeth. This was great. I'm so glad we got to get this information out there to everyone. Um, as I said, we are have been recording and the recording will be on our page. I'll show you here. This is our main Encompass Live page. Um, if you are looking for us online, I mean, you're obviously here today, but if you just type Encompass Live in your search engine of choice, we're the only thing called that so far. So nobody else can use that name. <laughs> it will come up with our pages, our archive pages. These are our upcoming shows and right underneath there is a link to our archives where the most recent one will be at the top of the page. So this is where today's recording will be. Uh, should be uh, done by the very latest, the end of this week, by the end of the week, um, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with my um, editing and processing of that. Um, everyone who attended today and everyone who pre-registered today will get an email from me letting you know when the recording is available. Um, we also push it out onto our social media, our Facebook page, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, mailing lists. Um, the hashtag for the show, um, it was on our slides in the beginning, is NCOMP live c-o-m-p-l-i-v-e a little abbreviation there so you can look for that too to see what we posted uh, while we're here in the archives i'll show you uh, this was last week's show we had a link to the recording a link to the presentation now the same thing for today's show a link to the google slides that um, elizabeth had and to the recording when it's on our um, youtube page we also have a search feature here i told you you can look through our um uh, previous shows um, any anything that's in the description of a session, person's name, whatever you can search for. You can search all the full archives, but you also see we have a link here to search most recent 12 months. That is because this is our full archive here on this page. And it is a long, long scroll page, which is why we have a search feature, so you don't have to just scroll through all of it. Um, but Encompass Live premiered in January 2009. So we have over 10 years worth of our archives here. Um, so you can search just for recent ones if you want recent information, but if you do watch something that is older, just pay attention to the original broadcast date. Everything has a date on it, so you know when it was first, um, the show, that episode was first done. So just pay attention to that. Be aware um, some of the information will stand the test of time, things like reading lists and things, of course, but some information may become outdated. Uh, services and products may change. Links might not work anymore. Some things may be shut down completely. Products might not, things might not exist, um, whatever. Just pay attention to the date. Uh, but we are librarians here. We This is one thing we do. We archive historical information, and we will always have our full archive out there for everyone just for historical purposes and like I said if there is anything old that is still valid we'll keep it up there but just pay attention when you are searching through our archives um, for that we also do have I did briefly mention a Facebook page this is our Facebook page if you are a Facebook user um, we post reminders about shows here's a reminder to log into this morning show when our recordings are available we post on here um, there's one from last week. Um, any new items, new um, information that we have, um, we post on here as well. So um, if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there to keep up on what we're doing. 
Um, other than that, that does wrap it up for today's show. I hope you join us next week when we have our pretty sweet tech. Um, this is our monthly episodes. Every Usually the last Wednesday of every month, our technology innovation um, librarian, Amanda Sweet, comes on and does her pretty sweet tech. Sweet, she's branded herself there. <laughs> um, where it's something tech related. Um, we sometimes will have things throughout the, the month that are techy, but if you're definitely into the tech side of things, this is the one to keep an eye on. And she's here once a month um, at the end of the month, and she will talk about something that um, related to that. Today, this one next week is technology versus human values, how to take control. Um, as Elizabeth was mentioning, we're doing a lot of things online, digitally using technology. So I think this is very timely of you know, what you um, need to be thinking about if you are doing things that way. Um, so please do um, join us for that show. Any of our upcoming ones, we've got our August show starting to sh um, appear on here. Um, I'll have more um, added to the schedule as I start finalizing with some other speakers. So just keep an eye on our page and sign up for any of our upcoming shows. Other than that, that wraps up for today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, this is great. And hopefully we'll see you on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>